Cassie L and you're watching Cassie's Learn to Play video for Cauldron Bubble and Boil by Magic Circle Games. Today we are going to learn how to play Cauldron Bubble and Boil and then we're going to watch three players play three rounds of the game, learn about some variants that might come with the game, as well as some expansions. If you'd like to jump to a particular section of the Learn to Play video, there are links down below to the different sections available. Ready to play? Let's go learn about how to play the potion brewing game Cauldron Bubble and Boil. Welcome to Cauldron Bubble and Boil. In this game, players are in competition as witches and warlocks attempting to brew the best potions. Players will collect resource cubes to use for their potion brewing, while also deciding if they would like to use the cards in their hand to cast hexes, save the potion recipes for endgame points, or plant gardens to grow more resources. Players will attempt to complete their saved potion recipes in the end of the game using the resources they have collected, and the player with the most points earned from completing their potions, among a few other ways, will become the leader of the coven and owner of the sought-after artifact, the Witch's Eye. During setup, each player receives one of these sheets called Diablery Tracks. These keep track of how many hexes players cast, and may help players earn points at the end of the game. Players will receive a scoring marker in their color for their individual Diablery track, and will also place a matching scoring marker near the victory point track to track their points throughout the game. Two types of tokens are placed in the center of the table, crown tokens and black corruption discs. Crown tokens are worth three points each at the end of the game, and corruption discs may or may not be helpful for a player, depending on how many a player receives during the game. We will learn more about these in a little bit. For three players, 24 resource cubes of each color are put out on the table. Each player takes a cauldron of their own and places one resource cube of each color from the table into their cauldron. Players may not look into their cauldron until the end of the game, so they must attempt to remember which resources they have in their cauldron throughout the game. Next, the the deck of cards is shuffled and players are dealt five cards each as their starting hand. Players keep their hands secret from their opponents. A start player is chosen and players are now ready to begin the game. Cauldron Bubble and Boil is played over the course of rounds dependent upon a game end triggering. One way the game may end is a player saves their seventh recipe. We'll learn about this in a little bit. Another way the game may end is two types of resources become depleted from the supply. A third way is if the last crown token or last corruption disc is taken from the supply. And the final fourth way is if one or more players reaches the end of their their Diablery track. Each round, starting with the first player and moving clockwise, players will take turns choosing to perform up to five different actions taken in a specific order. The first action a player may do is cast a hex from his hand. Each card has a hex cost on it, which a player must pay if he wants to cast the hex. After the cost is paid, the player also moves his marker up on the Diablery track once each time a hex is cast. Players may cast as many hexes as they'd like, as long as they can afford to do so. Once the player has paid the hex cost, he performs the action shown on the card. If a player casts more than one hex card on his turn, he must take a corruption disc for each additional hex and add it to his cauldron. Corruption discs may provide players points at the end of the game, as the player with the most corruption discs earns an extra five points but the player with the fewest earns an extra 10 points. Each corruption disc destroys a resource cube as well in the end of the game, which can make it more difficult for players to have the right amount of resources to brew their potions for end game points. Once a player has decided if and how many hexes he wishes to cast and finishes the actions on his hexes, the second action a player will do on his turn is harvest one cube from each card in his gardens. In the beginning of the game, no player will have any gardens to harvest because in order to do so, you must come to the third action a player can do on his turn, which is plant a garden. When a player decides to plant a garden, he takes at least two cards from his hand that have one matching resource type shown on the top of the card, and he places the cards in front of him, creating his garden. White cubes are wilds and may count as any resource type a player chooses. He then places the same number of resource cubes on his garden cards to match the resource type the garden will grow. When it comes back around to the active player's turn and he now has a garden to harvest, he must perform the second action of harvesting. He will take one cube off of each card in his garden and will place them in his cauldron. If he clears all the cards of cubes in a garden, he discards the cards and receives a crown token for endgame points. Players may have a maximum of two gardens at a time, and if a player chooses to destroy a garden, they do not earn the points, and they also lose a previously earned crown token if they have one. The fourth action a player may do on his turn is record a recipe. To do so, he simply places a card from his hand face down under his cauldron. He may not look at the recipes he has saved under his cauldron until the end of the game, just like how he cannot look into his cauldron until the end of the game. Saved recipes are what players will attempt to complete 
complete in the last portion of the game. Each recipe has a number of required resources a player must have in his cauldron in the end of the game in order to score it, as well as the point value it will be worth once complete. Remember, players may not look at the resources in their cauldrons, so it is imperative that players pay attention to what they gather and how many corruption discs they may have in the end of the game. The fifth action a player may choose to do is discard cards. Once he has chosen to do so, he then draws up until five cards in his hand. If he already has five cards in his hand, he may then draw one additional card. Once a player has finished drawing cards, his turn is over and the next player clockwise begins her turn. Players continue taking turns in this manner until one of the four endgame triggers occurs. Players will continue taking turns until it would be the start player's turn. At this point, the game would enter the scoring phase. There are many ways players may earn points in addition to potion brewing in the scoring phase. First, players look at the rank on their Diablery track. Each rank is worth one victory point. Next, the player who had the highest Diablery track score earns an additional five points, while the player with the lowest Diablery track score earns an additional ten points. Players then add their crone token points at three points per token. At this point, players may dump their cauldrons out and will now count up the resources and the corruption discs. The player with the most corruption discs earns an additional 5 points, while the player with the fewest corruption discs earns an additional 10 points. Next, players determine who has the most of each resource type collected. Whichever player has the most of each type of resource earns an additional 5 points per resource type. For example, the player who collected the most orange resources earns 5 points, the player who collected the most yellow resources also earns 5 points, and so on. If players were to tie for the most resource or fewest corruption discs, those those players each earn the full victory point reward. Now that players have scored all the bonus points available, players move into the brewing potion phase of the game. Players now reveal their saved recipes and attempt to assign resources to each of their recipes. White cubes are wilds and any color may be assigned to them. Each resource cube may only be assigned to one slot. If a player has any corruption discs, he must assign one resource cube of his choice to each corruption disc. If a player has any incomplete recipes after assigning resource cubes, they do not count for end game points. All completed recipes recipes earn their player the points on the card. After players add their completed potion recipe points to their score on the victory point track, the player with the most points becomes the leader of the coven and winner of the game. That's how you play Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil. Now that we know how to play, let's watch three rounds take place for three players. Okay, so we're going to take a look at Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil for three players. What we're going to do is watch three rounds go by just to get a good feel for how the gameplay would go. The game is already set up for all three players. Everybody has received their Diablery track, their player marker for their Diablery track, a matching marker for their victory point track, a cauldron with one of each resource cube already in it, and a starting hand of five cards. A start player has been chosen, and players are ready to begin the game. Remember, in Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil, turns are taken in a specific order. The first action will be to hex a player, then harvest gardens, plant a garden, record a recipe, and then discard cards if the player chooses, and draw up to five. The first player begins her turn by looking at her hand and making a decision on whether she would like to hex a player. Most of the start player's hand has to do with gardens, and since the start player doesn't have any gardens yet, she passes on hexing players for the first action. She then would move to the second action, which would be to harvest her gardens. Again, she doesn't have any gardens to harvest, so she moves into the third action, which would be to plant plant a garden. The start player decides to plant a red garden, which will yield three red cubes once complete. She plants her garden and puts three resource cubes into the garden taken from the supply. She now moves to the fourth action of recording a recipe. The start player is not ready to record any recipes yet, so she decides to move to the fifth action of discarding one card and drawing back up to five. The start player is now finished with her turn, so we move to the second player. The second player takes a look at her hand to decide if she would like to cast a hex for her first action and picks one card from her hand to cast. This card, called Unholiday, has a cost of moving her marker up one on the Diablery track, as well as removing a cube at random from her cauldron. In return, she will get to draw three cards into her hand. She pays the cost and performs the effect. After the second player has finished performing the effect on her card, she decides she's done casting hexes for this turn. She moves to the second action, which would be to harvest gardens, but again, like the first player, she doesn't have any gardens in the beginning of the game, so she moves to the third action of planting a garden. She decides to plant a yellow garden, which will yield seven yellow cubes upon completion. Now that she has planted one garden, she moves to the fourth action of recording a recipe. She records this recipe under her cauldron. The second player chooses to discard two cards and draw her hand back up to five. She is now finished with her turn, and it moves to the third player. The third player looks at their hand and decides if they want to cast a hex. They cast this hex, which has a cost of moving a marker up one on the Diablery track, removing one cube from your cauldron, and in return, all 
all other players will gain one corruption disc to their cauldron. She pays the cost and performs the effect. The third player is finished casting hexes, has no gardens to harvest, so moves right into planting a garden. The third player plants an orange garden, which will yield four orange cubes upon completion. Remember, white cubes count as wilds and may be any color. The third player is not out of cards, so cannot record any recipes, has nothing to discard, and draws their hand back up to five. We now return to the start player, who decides again if they want to take the first action of hexing a player. They cast the same hex as the third player, which has a cost of moving their marker up one on the Diablery track, removing a cube from their cauldron, and makes all other players gain a corruption disc to their cauldron. The first player is finished casting hexes, so she now moves into the second action of harvesting gardens, because she now has gardens to harvest. She removes one cube from each card in all of the gardens. She now moves into the planting a garden phase, and plants an orange garden, which will yield four orange cubes. The start player then decides to record one recipe. The start player does not want to discard her remaining card, so she draws her hand back up to five, and then passes turn. Now we're back to the second player, who again has to decide if they want to hex a player. The second player decides to cast this card, which has a cost of moving their marker up one on the Diablery track, and makes them discard one card from their hand. In return, all other players discard a card or gain a corruption disc. The second player is finished casting hexes and moves into the harvesting garden phase. They remove one cube from each card in their garden. Now for the third action, they plant an orange garden, which will yield seven orange cubes upon completion. The second player is now out of cards, so they cannot record any recipes for the fourth action. They have nothing to discard, so they draw their hand back up to five. We now move to the third player, who decides to cast this hex for their first action. This hex has a cost of moving their marker up one on the Diablery track, as well as adding one corruption disc to their cauldron. In return, they get to take two cubes from another player's garden and put one into their cauldron and one into any garden they choose. They now move into the second action of harvesting their gardens. Because they remove all of the cubes from this garden, they turn the garden into the discard pile and receive one crown token worth three points at the end of the game. The third player now moves into the third action of planting a garden. They plant one green garden. The third player records one recipe discards one card, and draws their hand back up to five. We're now back to the first player, who looks at their hand and decides that they don't want to cast any hexes this turn. They then move to the second action of harvesting both of their gardens. Because the third player put two cubes on one of their gardens, and the cubes are on the same card, this garden will not be complete this turn. Now that they've harvested both of their gardens, they move to the third action where they would be able to plant a garden, but because they already have the max of two gardens available, they cannot plant any more gardens. Instead, the first player moves right into the fourth action of recording one recipe. She then discards one card and draws her hand back up to five. We're now at the second player's turn, and they're gonna take a look at their hand to see if they wanna cast any hexes. The second player casts this hex, which has the cost of moving their marker up one on the Diablery track and removing two cubes from their cauldron. In return, they get a victory point for every cube in one of their gardens. They go with their orange garden because they will earn seven victory points for the seven orange cubes in the garden. The second player now moves into the harvesting garden phase. One garden becomes complete, and the other one remains. They earn one crown token for the complete garden. The second player now moves into the third action of planting a garden. They plant a yellow garden, which will yield five yellow cubes upon completion. The second player now records one recipe and draws their hand back up to five. The second player has now finished their turn, so we move to the third player who is going to take their third turn. The third player looks at their hand and decides to cast this card again. They pay the cost and perform the effect. They take yellow cubes from the second player again, and they put one in their cauldron and one in the first player's garden. The third player has finished casting hexes, so they move to the second action of harvesting their garden. They complete their green garden, so they earn one more crown token for endgame points. They now move to the third action for their turn and plant an orange garden. The third player moves into the fourth action now of recording a recipe. They have one card left, so they draw their hand back up to five. We now go back to the star player's turn and continue playing the game this way until one of those endgame triggers occurs. So that was three rounds for three players of Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil. Now that we know how to play the game and we've watched the game play, play for a little bit, let's learn about some of the variants and some of the expansions that might become available in Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil. Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil comes with three variants that players may choose to use for their game. The first is called Kindly Crown. This variant allows players to record recipes face up and also allows players to briefly glance into their cauldrons while the deck is being shuffled. The second variant adjusts the gameplay time. Players may choose to change the number of recipes needed to trigger the end of the game to five for a shorter game or eight to nine for a longer game. The final variant is called Hard Stop. This variant makes the game end immediately upon the end game trigger occurring 
instead of allowing players to play out the rest of the round. Those were the variants for Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil. Now let's visit the potential expansions. The first expansion includes the advanced game Alternative Victory Deck. This optional deck provides additional variations during the game, which may affect scoring, gameplay, or both. Players have a few options for using the Alternative Victory Deck. The first way is players draw one to three random cards to use during the game. The second way is each player but the first draws two and picks one of the two to use during the game. The final way players may use the Alternative Victory Deck begins with the player who will take her turn last. She draws three cards, then chooses from two to none of the cards drawn to play and keeps them secret. All other players draw two cards and choose either one or none of the cards to play and keep them secret. Once all players have chosen, beginning with the last player, they reveal the cards. If the last player chose fewer cards than there are players, the next to the last player then reveals any cards she chose. Players continue revealing cards until there are as many cards revealed as there are players. Any additional cards chosen are not used during the game. And that is the first expansion, the Alternative Victory Deck. The second expansion uses this deck of cards known as the Moon Deck. This optional deck provides additional variations during the game, which may affect scoring, gameplay, or both. There are a few ways in which players may use the Moon Deck. The first variant of the Moon Deck is called Lunar Month. The deck is constructed in an order with the card number one on top and the card number eight on the bottom. Whenever it is the start player's turn, a new Moon card is revealed and all players must abide by the instructions on the card. When the cards run out, the start player begins again with the Moon card numbered one. The second variant for the Moon Deck is called Lunar Year. It plays similarly to the first variant, except the moon deck is shuffled instead of placed in order. The final variant for the moon deck is similar to the second variant in which the deck is shuffled, but each player draws a new moon card on their turn instead of only the starting player. And that was the second expansion, the moon deck. The third expansion to Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil is called the Coven Roll Expansion. This expansion allows players to take on roles that provide special abilities. There are two ways players may use the Coven Roll Expansion. The first is the Apprentice version. Players set aside the traitor's switch. Then three roll cards are discarded at random, not to be used in the game. The remaining roll cards are placed face up upon the table, including the traitor's switch. During the game, players may decide to acquire a roll card instead of recording a recipe. To claim a roll, a player must qualify. Each roll card has a requirement listed on the bottom of it, which a player must meet in order to take that roll. Players may only have one roll card at a time and may not decide to discard their rolls. If a player is forced to discard her roll, she places it back in the center of the table for others to claim. The second way to use the Coven Roll expansion is the Adept version. In this version, the Traitorous Witch is not used in the game and is removed from the deck. Then, each player is dealt two random roll cards from the Coven Roll deck, and each player selects one of the two rolls they are dealt to play as. The remaining roll cards are discarded and are not used in the game. Players ignore the requirements on the bottom of the card and cannot discard their roll. And that was the third expansion, the Coven Roll expansion. And that, which is in Wizards, was Cauldron, Bubble and Boil from Magic Circle Games. Thanks for watching learn to play video for Cauldron Bubble and Boil for Magic Circle Games. If you have any questions about the game, feel free to leave some comments down below. And if you'd like to learn more about the game in general, there are some links listed as well. I'm Cassie, and you just watched the learn to play video for Cauldron Bubble and Boil for Magic Circle Games.